dominance is a bit like a Sierpinski space, and then you can do um, topology uh, in a topos, and it will apply to the plane topological spaces. It also applies to to Macaus to some extent, and also it applies to types of programming languages. Okay, but here I want to do it. I don't want to get as far as the topos, just because I don't have time. So what is a locale? So there are many physicists here. I suppose uh, many of you know what a locale is. Um, well, a locale is a kind of a space. And in fact, like other people, I will call locale spaces. <coughs> and I'm going to do that not just to emphasize that they are spaces, but also because sometimes I want to make assertions without committing myself to whether I'm talking about topological spaces or locales. And I want to make the same assertion. So like in a topological space, what is primary about a locale is the open sets, right? But there's a difference that in topology, an open set is made out of points, where, whereas in a locale, it's the opposite way around. Start with the opens, and if you can get points, you get them by, by open sets, by filters of open sets. Um, so for me, I think the big... The biggest difference between topological spaces and locales is not that, but rather that uh, this, the collection of subspaces in locale theory and in topology, they look very different. So for example, in topology, the subspaces form a Boolean algebra, but uh, in, in locale theory, they form a co-frame, whatever that is. And uh, the, for example, the subspaces of the real line are very different when you look at them in the category of locales or when you look at them in this category of topological space. So let's recall the usual mathematical definition, which is the one I'm not going to work with. So a frame is a complete lattice, and then the idea is that it will be the lattice of opens, and then you have the distributivity of finite mates over arbitrary joints, and then a frame homomorphism is a function that preserves the, the structures of finite mates and arbitrary joints, and of course, the idea is that frame homomorphisms corresponds to inverse images of continuous functions. And the question is, is that? Okay, so then you define the category of locales to be the opposite of the category of frames and frame homomorphisms. And so, under this definition, a locale is a frame. But uh, is this what uh, a locale really is? And... Um, now, of course, fate always chases you, and uh, what I brought in the next uh, slide made Peter Johnston to be the chair of the session. Sorry about that. <laughs> Nothing personal. <laughs> yes. So, Isabel says uh, in a paper, the needed background is almost all in Johnston's town spaces, if you can stand the point of view. Johnston's locales keep intruding the frames into innocent conversation, Rather, as, as if people were continually showing you their skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> I think perhaps Peter agrees with that, because uh, the way he wrote about locales in uh, the elephant is very much yeah. different from, from <coughs> Um And then the problem with Isbell uh, papers is that although he doesn't uh, work with the skeletons, uh, at least for me, his papers are impenetrable. But um, if you read that, well, so this is the approach he's going to take. Um, you can summarize this uh, by what I said before, but it doesn't matter. So another person who worked extensively using this idea, so the idea that you think of a locale as a, coll as a collection of sub-locales, some of which are open, and then there are some axioms relating the open sublocals with all the other sublocals, but open sublocals are just, you know, some special kind of sublocals. And Vermeuler um, writes his papers in this style, and uh, uh, Vermeuler's papers I can understand. And, and it's a, a really nice way of, uh, of writing about locales. But this is not what I'm going to do. Oops, wrong thing to do. No, I, I don't come, I don't come from, physics or from topos theory, 
to come from computation. And they come from this chain of ideas that actually started from Brouwer. So Brouwer first was a topologist, but then he was known for his work on constructive mathematics. And then he discovered a strong link between continuity and you know, constructibility of functions. And this led to a lot of work by several people. For example, Scott emphasized that open sets are sets of somehow a finite character. Then Michael Smith uh, identified uh, open sets in a topological space with the so-called semi-decidable properties in computability theory. Actually, Ershoff is the last person here. I think so, yes. Oh. Um, and then Plotkin in a, in a nice paper calls them physically feasible properties. So one, one example would be something like this. Um, so you can write a computer program to print forever the decimal expansion of pi. Now you look at this computer running and so you see digits coming and coming forever. And then you may ask, for example, am I really going to see pi? Well, this property is not observable because in order to observe it, you have to actually know the entire input output, which is not possible in finite time. But uh, if you ask, is the output different from pi? Then this is observable because if it's different from pi, after you observe long enough, then you'll know that it's not there. So Samson Abramsky wrote a paper on the logic of observable properties, and then he made the connection between topological spaces and locales that people knew already, but uh, he looked at this from the point of view of, uh, of the, the logic of computation. And uh, stone duality is, is, uh, uh, is the main feature there. And in fact, Paul Taylor also comes from this line of research. And Steve Vickers wrote the book Topology Biologic and he calls them thermable properties. So they come under several names as you can see. And so I'm not going to commit myself to any name, I'm just going to call them opens. I'm going to skip this slide because I have more slides that, I'm, that I won't be able to show you. Now the title says well maybe locals are made out of points after all. Now, if you take this at face value, this is wrong. For example, even the real line on the Kantor space, they, they don't need to have enough points depending on the topos you're looking at. So if your topos has classical logic, then yes, they do have enough points. But uh, if only constructive mathematics is available, as is generally the case in any topos, then that's not the case, and in fact, Mike Foreman and Martin Highland showed in a nice paper that uh, the Cantor space have enough, has enough points in a topos, so the locale, I'm talking about the locale, if and only if a certain axiom, so can be called the fun theorem, which uh, uh, was accepted by Brouwer holds. Now, this, whether or not Brouwer accepts it, it doesn't matter, the point is that in some toposes, this axiom doesn't hold. I mean, often it doesn't hold. And in fact, even more to contradict my title, there are locales that don't have any points at all, even if you are willing to use classical mathematics. So one of them, identified by Isbell, is the smallest dense sublocale. So every locale as a smallest than sublocal, even you know, even the real line, and uh, and this is actually you can say it's a very strong form of the bare category theorem. So the bare category theorem, when it holds in a topological space, it says that the intersection of countably many dense open sets is dense, and you can use this for a variety of things like Hambanach type theorems and things like that. And uh, because there is a smallest dense sublocale, it is true that in any locale, the intersection of any collection of dense open sets 
is dense. Another example I like <coughs> is a uh, recent work by Alex Simpson. So he considered axioms for random sequences, and there are a variety of interesting axioms for, for random sequences. All of them, if taken individually, make sense. But if you take them together, then you see that there is no sequence that satisfies all these axioms. But, however, you can use these axioms that define properties of sequences to generate the opens of a locale, and this locale is a very non-trivial sub-locale of the Cantor space, so infinite sequences of head and tails. Um, and there are other examples as well. And there's something I call synthetic topology. It doesn't mean that it is actually a subject synthetic topology yet. Um, but uh, the idea is to, well, never mind. So let's reason about, about locales or spaces as if they were made of points. And I want this to apply in particular to topological spaces, to locales, and also to types in programming languages or to objects in a category for computability theory. And uh, the price is that uh, you have to give up classical logic because this is turns out to be incompatible with classical logic. So even you know if you believe in classical logic you will end up building a universe of discourse to talk about this which doesn't satisfy classical logic. And the methodology is to use the lambda calculus and more generally category theory and topos theory. Okay? And some in some cases, particularly in the work by Andre Bauer and Davray Lesnik, um, sometimes it's interesting to postulate anti-classical axioms. Um, so things that, uh, you know, they are not true for sets, but uh, maybe if you think of the sets as, as, as if they were spaces, they make sense. So if you happen to know about synthetic differential geometry, this is, uh, this is inspired by that, and again, you, you, you postulate anti-classical axioms. So the payoff, well, in my opinion, you may disagree, is that uh, you get clean and short proofs that are very general because they apply to locales, spaces, types of programming languages, but also these proofs have a strong computational content. And in fact, I amuse myself by actually writing down this, some of these proofs in a computer and then getting answers. And this is even the case where computational content is not what you were looking for. For example, in, in topology. Um, and also, I dis by doing this, I discovered some counterintuitive results in computability theory, but uh, this is not what I want to talk about here. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to now move to a set of older slides, and this is because uh, Steve Vickers suggested that. He said, oh, I liked your talk in, in Dutch a few years ago. A few years ago was actually 2002, so eight years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, let me show you this slide before I move to the other slides. So suppose you try to prove something very innocent in local theory. So a closed set local of a compact local is itself compact. Now using Isbell's skeletons, so what you do is the following. So you define sub local. There's a variety of way of doing that, but uh, so people often use nuclei. I myself am guilty of this, I, I love nuclear, but this is surgery or anatomy, working with skeletons. Then you define which nuclei you call closed, then you define which nuclei you call compact, and then you do some funny lattice theory, and then in a couple of pages you show this very simple theory, right? And then the main point is that the proof looks very different from the proven topology. And then, okay, so I think my slides uh, in, in 2002 were better than the, what follows here, so I moved to them. So I have this uh, amusing title. We need to be able to read that, that's important. Uh, so, 10 proofs in topology that together fit in a single page of Fermat's book, using the margin only. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and uh, of course, um, that's with the Fermat's handwriting uh, because Fermat was not alive. Uh, alive, I asked my colleague Reinhold Heckman to write it down for me, and so he kindly wrote the proofs there. Not the statements of the theorems, though, but uh, we're going to get. <coughs> so, uh, I don't know whether this is big enough, and uh, I was going to use another computer. Does anybody know how to make Apple read to, you know? Okay, maybe that's better, isn't it? Uh, so I'm going to consider not, not very deep topological theorems, but the point is that these topological theorems, when you look at them in locales, they, they get more complicated than they should be, in my opinion. Okay, because in topology the proofs are very short, so there is no point of doing this, this exercise. So a compact subspace of a house of space is closed, a closed subspace of a compact space is compact, you know, and things like that. Continuous images of compact spaces are compact, binary Tikhonov theorem. And now this one, in fact, uh, Peter Johnston wrote a paper about that. It's a very nice paper called uh, Open Locals and Exponentiation. Uh, so if x is an exponentiable local, and uh, then and y is Hausdorff, then the function space is again Hausdorff. And things like that. show things about program maps and, and so on. The proofs are going to be actually one-line proofs. And, uh, well, I guess three-quarters of this room is familiar with the lambda calculus, but it doesn't have to, to repeat it a bit. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a calculus of functions. So, uh, so 3 plus y is a real number, but if you want to emphasize that you think of the function, then you just write lambda y 3x plus y, and so this is the function that maps y to the function 3 plus y. And, uh, and if you want uh, a function that takes a real number to a function, you can like, write lambda x, lambda y, x plus y, and this is the function that takes x to the function that adds y to x. So now, to make the, the, the lambda calculus work in any category, but think here about topological spaces, for simplicity, is the question is, can you topologize the functions from x to y, the continuous function, so cx, y is a continuous function from x to y, so that for all spaces A, a function f, for the set of continuous functions, is continuous if and only if um, if and only the transpose f bar is continuous, okay? Defined by that equation. And the answer is no. And this question was asked even before category theory by, I think, by Kurevich to Fox. And then slowly people starting, started to answer this question. So Fox said, well, you can do that. If, um, if x is a locally compact, I think he did for metric spaces, and then people generalize to house of spaces, and then you generalize. And then the final answer was by, um, gosh, by Brian Day and uh, somebody else. Kelly. Kelly, yes. So the answer is if and only if x is a so-called core compact space, and this means that the lattice of open sets form a so-called continuous lattice. But they did this one year before Lennon Scott introduced the notion of continuous lattice, so they don't, didn't call it that. But in fact, they came up for the first time with an example of a continuous lattice, so precisely uh, for, characterizing, for characterizing this precisely. So, you can say top is not Cartesian closed. And there are many ways to solve this problem. 
we have in fact people in this room who don't have worked in this problem, Brown, for example. So there are two approaches. One is to consider a smaller category. And there are many such categories which are Cartesian closed. So sequential spaces, compactly generated spaces, quotients of co compact spaces, quotients of second countable spaces. So there are lots of subcategories which are Cartesian closed. Or you can take the opposite approach. And in fact, to prove the characterization of the exponential spaces, they and Kelly uh, actually work in a bigger category. And there are many such categories of filter spaces, limit spaces, topological spaces, quasi topological spaces, and pre sheets. But the problem with pre sheets is that. In a way, they are too large. Okay, so now I'm going to be a bit informal in this slide. This cannot be formulated as I say, but uh, it will do for this talk. So the lambda definability lemma says if you have x and y topological spaces, and uh, if you lambda define a uh, continuous function, you know, using continuous functions, then the function you define using the lambda calculus will again be itself continuous. And uh, here is a proof sketch. So you work with this bigger Cartesian plus category, and then you get this, I call it an imaginary space. You know, it's like a square root of 2, so 2 to the power minus 1. Um, so this gives you an imaginary space. And then the lambda expression, when it is interpreted, it, you, it needs to use the larger category. But in the end, it defines a function from x to y. So it doesn't matter. It's a bit like a conservativity result. So again, I'm going to be informal. I could give you the formal definitions, but then the, the talk will be just about giving the definitions. I don't want the talk to degenerate into that. But intuitively, so in many situations, such as the ones considered in this in the slides that follow, the imaginary spaces obey the rules of real spaces. Okay, so you can think of these spaces as they were really topological spaces. And uh, well hopefully look out, but we're going to come back to this. So I'm going to work with a wonderful Sierpinski space. So the Sierpinski space has, classically speaking, two points. And uh, one is isolated, so the point 1 or true, and the other one is a limit point, 0 or false. And this Sierpinski space comes from this well, it comes from many directions, but uh, to my work, it comes from this identification of open sets with open sets that are detectable by a computational process. So the output of the computational process will be defined in the Sapinski space, and this is a very impoverished computational process. It will tell you yes, if the property holds, but if it doesn't, it won't tell you anything. So that's why the, the topology is not symmetric. That's why the, uh, the point zero is not open. The main point is that it's one and two. So a function from a space, the space space is continuous if the inverse image of one is open. And secondly, a subset of X is open if and only if the characteristic function that assigns one to the points in the set is continuous. So now, what you're going to do is the following. We're going to use the Sierpinski space, S, to define all the topological notions. All the, let's say, the basic, the core topological notions. So the first one is the following. Um, so let Q be a subspace of the space X, 
and then define this function before we know whether it is continuous, the for all functional, that takes a p and uh, it answers 1 if and only if for all in x and q the predicate p holds. And it turns out that uh, the space is compact if and only if q is continuous. Now it doesn't matter here whether x is exponentiable. We can play this trick of using these imaginary spaces. And in fact, uh, in, in, in one work by Steve Vickers and Chris Townsend that I mentioned earlier, they do just that. They work with pre sheaves and uh, of course there is one difference if you want to do this with locales because in locales you cannot first define a function and then ask whether it is continuous or not you can only define continuous functions so you use the same trick as people do in, in, in topos theory what you do is you define a function in the opposite direction from s to s to the power x and then ask this function to have a right adjoint okay, that's the definition, the definition of the quantifiers and then there are other functions like and and or, and and or they are continuous okay? so let's see how then one proves um, that a compact subspace of a household space is closed um, so, you have to look at the data, okay? So, the data is that the space is compact. Well, it means that we have this functional, okay? And uh, the other data is that x is Hausdorff. Well, so if you look at uh, what Hausdorff means, well, Hausdorff means for topological spaces, any two points can be separated by these joint neighborhoods and then an easy lemma is that this is equivalent to saying that the diagonal is closed so the diagonal is just uh, Function. And this is just a function that tells whether two points are different. Okay, so that's the data. So the data is two functionals. It's too high up for me point. Uh, so it's this. So this is the input, Hausdorff and compact. And now what you have to show is that it's closed. So you have to show that you can somehow detect continuously the complement of the compact set Q. Um, so what you do then is you write this as an expression in the lambda calculus using the two given continuous functionals. So x is not in q if for all y in q x is different from y, right? So that's the way of saying this. Now, if you interpret this in topological spaces, then that's it. But then, if you instead interpret this in locales, you have to be a bit, a bit more careful. You have to show that actually this lambda expression satisfies some universal property. But the point here is the following. So although locales may not have enough points, in fact they may have not, no point at all, it doesn't matter, you are still reasoning because of the lambda calculus as, we, as, as if we had points. Okay? Um, so to make this clear, So this is the lambda expression we have. And now, this is an example of how you translate the lambda expression into the language of Cartesian closed categories. So we have uh, these two continuous maps. Then you take the exponential transpose of the inequality map. And then, and then you define by composition the characteristic function of the complement of the diagonal. 
So as I said before, in topology that's the proof, but now in local theory we need an extra step, which is to show that this dotted map that we have defined actually satisfies the universal property of a closed set, of an open set. Um, gosh, I'm not going to get into completely generated locales. Um, so I'll show you a few more examples, okay? Uh, so close up space of a, of a compact space is compact. Okay, so what is the data? Well, the space is compact, so we have the universal quantifier. The subspace is closed, so we are allowed to, to look at the complement of C, and uh, we can always use OR. So what we have to do now is to show that if we have the quantifier for the space, and the detector for the complement of C, then we can define the quantifier of C. And if we can define the quantifier of C, then uh, we have then uh, show, shown that um, C is compact. So this is how you would do it. So for all X in C, a continuous property holds. If and only if, for all X in X, if X is in C, then P of X holds. Okay? And these slides were designed so that I could write something on top, but uh, you can write this, this disjunction as if C is in C, then P holds. And again, that's it as a proof for topological spaces, but if you were doing this in locales, then there is the extra step of showing that this expression has the universal property of the universal quantifier. So let's do a few more examples. Okay, so well, let's skip this. So now it becomes routine. So now you can do these exercises. Is that the end of my talk? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the binary Tikhonov theorem, you know, it gives you some work to do it, particularly in locales. But here it's trivial. So you have two spaces, X and Y, and they are both compact. So each of them have their quantifiers, and what you have to do is to find the quantifier for the product. Well, for all z in the product, so for all pairs z, p of z holds if and only if for all x and for all y, p of x y holds. Okay, and that's a proof. Again, okay. you need to show, but this is easy, I promise you. You need to show that the map that you have defined does satisfy the universal property of the quantifier. Now, um, second thing, I uh, say something about Johnston, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, in his really nice paper about open locales and exponentiation, he proved the following. So, if x is exponentiable and y is Hausdorff, then y to the over x is Hausdorff, and of course he was working constructively and so he had to say something else additionally. So he had to say that additionally x is an open open locale. People sometimes call them overt, some people call them locales with open domain. But basically it means that that you have this functional available. And again, so the, the, the universal quantifier was the right adjoint of the map going in the opposite direction, and then the existential quantifier is instead left adjoint. Now, if you have classical logic, you can prove that this map always exists. You use excluded middle and say, if this holds, then you define it like this. If not, then you define it like that. Um, and then Peter Johnston has many interesting lemmas proving very inter many interesting facts about um, about um, open locales or locales with open domains over which the existential quantifier holds and then he proved this theorem so another thing that Peter did was in order to prove this theorem he looked 
concretely what this looks like. So by looking at an analog of the compact open topology, which is the topology that gives you the exponential, which was actually previously developed by Martin Hyatt uh, in a paper called Exponentials, no, Function Spaces in the Category of Locales, I think it was called. Um, and then, so this was, an, I, I, I learned uh, lots of nice things from these two papers, but it gets very messy because you have to look at what this concretely looks like. But here, you just say, well, okay, so you want to show it's Hausdorff, so you have to essentially say when two functions are different. Now, when are two functions different? When there is a point at which they differ. Okay? And then you go and show that uh, this function you have defined satisfies the universal property. So, um, I hope you will still speak to me, uh, Peter, after <laughs> saying twice something. <laughs> It was like I was planning that I go in the chair. So, <laughs> um, so and also it's, it's interesting because you don't need to know what the topology of this locale is, right? So you just need to use the universal property. So you need to use category theory. Okay, I'm just going to skip this. Okay, so now how do we know that the basic open sets of the exponential y to the x have to be the sets in the, in the compact open topology? For me, it is really a mystery how Fox in 1935 came with this topology, you know, and said, okay, this is the topology you have to have. So where did it come from? And then you do the calculation and it works. Anyway, so here you can see how, where it comes from, okay? So, suppose you have a compact subset or subspace of X and an open subset of Y and so a basic open in the, a sub-basic open set in the compact open topology is a set of all functions that map the compact set into the open set and again, you can define this by this lambda expression, and therefore, you know, it is automatically continuous. Now, this is only half of the explanation, because it doesn't explain why it is that uh, only, I mean, on se this sets, why this sets suffice. I don't have any good explanation of that. I don't know if anybody has a good explanation of why this sets suffice. But at least you have a good explanation of why they are open. So we start saying, okay, assume the, fun the exponential existed, then by this calculation, you know that these sets have to be open, right? Mm -hmm. This is the only thing we're trying. I, th I think in effect Fox did that in his paper. To do what? Well, to, to show that uh, he, he has some of that idea. Yeah, he has it somehow, but it was a bit clumsy because he didn't have the category theory, and so yeah, he, of course. and so he didn't have the notion of exponential. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and uh, even if he didn't have an uh, clear argument, he certainly had a clear picture in his mind in order to be able to to, to write that. Okay, and now I have ten minutes, and I think I can stop this talk and then come back to the other talk. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay, so let me just say what I said before. What is this funny thing here? Uh, so there are two solutions in, in, in topology. One is work with a subcategory, which is Cartesian closed, or else work with a bigger category, which is also Cartesian closed. Um, um, it would be desirable to work with a bigger one because your theorems apply them to all spaces but on the other hand if you restrict to compactly generated spaces that's not so bad because spaces that you encounter are typically compactly generated anyway uh, so the first one would be a more pragmatic approach now what are the solutions in local theory and this is the problem I have so um, there, there's actually no, they're, they're non existing, okay? So if you try to work with a, identify a, a, a subcategory, well, 
I'll try in 10 minutes to, to tell you what goes wrong. And uh, if you try to come up with a super category, then you stumble in problems of size. So if you take three shapes of the locale, so the, each three shape is going to be large, it's not going to be a set. And so the category is super large. So um, you get into foundational trouble. Um, but now what Steve Vickers and Chris Townsend did was to show, well, okay, for many of these proofs that we have seen in these slides, in the handy written slides, it doesn't matter because as the category as such doesn't exist. But um, some of these exponentials are going to exist when you need them, okay? And, uh, uh, and one nice example, they had this, uh, this so-called double power local, and they showed that actually, this is very interesting, that it's like taking two exponentials in the Sierpinski space, and the problem is that this exponential here is not a local, but it exists as a pre-sheaf of the right size, no trouble, okay? And then this is again a locale. Of course, because this is a locale. But it has the universal property, okay? So it's a bit clumsy, so you can make the proofs work often, but uh, you don't really have a Cartesian closed category. Okay. I'm just going to say something, not a, not a, a lot of words. So how can you make uh, this work. So let's go back to compactly generated household spaces. I'm going to do this for simplicity. You can do it as Ronnie Brown did it in the 60s for arbitrary spaces, but uh, things are going to be simpler for this talk in the household case. So you take the co-limit of the compact subspaces of X, and you call this Kx. Some people call them the qualification of X, but is the it is the compactly generated reflection. Uh, so this in topology is just X with a finer topology and therefore is Hausdorff 2. And uh, oops, this slide doesn't make sense. I deleted some things and not the don't read the last line. So X is compactly generated if and only if when you do this you get when you do KX, you this potentially finer topology is actually your, um, your topology. And so how do you prove Cartesian closeness? Well, you can read Matt Lane's proof, or you can read Ronnie Brown's proof, and you can read anybody else's proof, and they'll look different. But essentially the proof works as follows. So the three key facts. One is that uh, compact house of spaces are exponential. The second key fact is that K is a co-reflection into this subcategory of compactly generated house of spaces. And the third key fact, which is going to give us lots of trouble later, is that uh, they form an exponential ideal in the house of spaces. So um, if Y is Hausdorff, then any function space with values in y is, is again house of, and also this is close under limits. So that's the way you can calculate the exponential. Um, so let's look at the exponent first. So you first decompose x as a co-limit. And then uh, these spaces are, okay, so now, and then you take the reflection. Now, if this were to exist, which we don't know yet, but if it were to exist, then because this is a contravariant functor, then you transform the co-limits into limits. So you take, you break down x into a little compact house of subspaces, take the exponentials, and take the limit, and then this is not necessarily compactly generated, but you take the reflection, and then you sit down with a piece of paper and then you show that this actually has the universal property of an exponential. Now, uh, I have five minutes left, so I want to finish in one minute. Uh, when you do this with locales, you can get um, up to some point, and I have written a 
paper about that. But uh, the key facts break down. One remains true for the colors. Uh, two, it may be true, but I don't know how. So it may be true, but I don't know how to prove that or how to disprove that. Uh, three, it gets you into difficulties. Well, to show that house of spaces form an exponential ideals, well, Johnston showed that we need this space here actually to be open or avert. But uh, we didn't say that uh, we were looking at overt compact subspaces here only. And now everything changes if you start doing the theory of compactly generated spaces by looking at new parts of spaces. And I don't know whether limits of houses, locales, are houses. I don't know, maybe you know the answer. I tried to find this in the literature, but I didn't find anything. I tried to prove it myself, I couldn't. So, I skip some the, thing, the nice thing I proved, and then I finish with the summary. Uh, so synthetic topology wor works well for space, topological spaces and program types. The difficulty is making it work for locales, and it, it does work in some interesting cases, but not in general. It would be very nice to make it work. So there is no known large enough Cartesian closed category of locales, and there is no known Small enough supercategory of locales. <laughs> <laughs> Problems of sizes in, in, in two conflicting directions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a few questions or comments. Uh, I'm just going to ask a question for the speakers here about quasi topological spaces, because um, uh, Dow and Allender were at one time very keen on them book, yeah. but then they decided to abandon it because the number of quasi-topologies on the two-point space was a proper class. Yeah. Now, is, do you still feel this is a sensible reason for abandoning it? It makes you feel uneasy, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me feel uneasy. And I get the same feeling of uneasiness about famous Kantian topological spaces. They're just not in that many of them. And it's something that you don't notice when, when you do the theory. The theory looks beautiful, but then you stop and think, well, how, how many some ecological spaces where the ecological space are, are there? And there's almost always a proper class. Um, so that category is, is horrendously large. Yeah. The, the other thing about the house school space is because you do get a nice uh, Cartesian closed category by starting with compact house school spaces. And taking the final topology with respect to. Yeah, but that's in, in the Kant, you have the problem of overtness. Yeah. I mean, that's why I don't understand. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so let me explain this. Um, so if y is Hausdorff, then y to the x is Hausdorff again. But uh, in local theory, there is something hidden if you want to reason constructively, which is that you need this to be overt or open which means that uh, you have a, an existential quantifier. So it's basically a predicate that detects whether open sets are non-empty, if you wish. Um, and, um, and, and this is hidden in topology for two reasons. One, well, is that you reason classically, but also because you have the points. And because you have the points, I mean, you can always find the existential quantifier because uh, inhabitedness means that there is a point. Yeah. Constructively, yeah. even constructively, spatial work on the other Yeah. Yeah, so it's not even clear whether there is a sub cartesian to those categories of locales as far as is. I don't conjecture that there is one. I would like one to exist, <laughs> but um, it would be. It's very hard. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How disastrous is it not to have it? Oh well. Uh, my thought then uh, <laughs> <laughs> was not the trend. <laughs>